Welcome to Fruity Knitting. I'm Andrea. And I'm Andrew. And this is episode 66. And since we've come back from the Shetland Wool Week, our most recent episodes have been featuring a lot of Shetland themed interviews. And we're going to continue that again with this episode with two feature interviews. The first one is with the Shetland farmer, Ronnie Janssen, who many of you may have already met at the Edinburgh Yarn Festival. He's been a vendor there for the last few years, selling his 100% organic Shetland yarns, Uradal yarns, because his farm is called Uradal. And this time, Andrew has a turn at interviewing. Yeah, that's right. We had a great day at the farm. I started off speaking to Ronnie in the farmhouse, and after that we went out to the barn where Ronnie showed us some of the different types of fleeces. We then went out into the fields where we got some great footage of the sheepdogs working with the flock on the hills, which was really fun. Yeah, it wasn't raining, so we, could, we got to take the drone out, and so I think you'll yep. really enjoy that footage. Our second interview is with Dr. Carol Christensen, who is the curator of the Shetland Museum and Archives. And we've had Carol on the show before. And this time, Carol tells us about her research project on Shetland piled rugs from the 18th and 19th century. And these rugs are called tatted rugs. And they were hand spun, hand dyed, hand woven and sewn by men as well as women. Uh, multi-purpose bed covers and they were probably one of the most colourful and valuable items in a crofter's household. So we get to see one of these rugs that dates back to around 1860 and even after 160 years of use it's still in fantastic condition. They're, they're amazing things. But what's really interesting is that they're covered in symbols of Shetland and Nordic folklore and Carol tells us some of the stories behind these symbols and that's really fascinating and fun. Yep. We're also going to meet Diana Waller, who may be better known as Paper Tiger. Diana's our guest on Knitters of the World, and she's a budding designer, knitwear designer with a particular affinity for traditional Nordic knitting. So that's coming up. We've also got a little bit of lace from Andrea, and I've got a new project coming up. Yeah. I'm trying not to get too tangled up in my yarn here, but we'll start with my lace project, which has been racing along I have to say probably one of the fastest projects I've done in a long time it does help knitting on 4.5 millimeter needles so here you go you can see some of it here and it, I've been knitting it in Louisa Harding's 100% cashmere gilly yarn which is totally beautiful and despite being 100% cashmere there is absolutely no sign of pilling and which I love and many of you know that I don't like to use yarns that peel easily. So I just want to quickly talk about this yarn or, or talk about pilling actually. I found it very interesting um, back in our interview with Mayak, you might remember a few episodes ago, speaking to Andreas and just to remind you, Andreas is the vet who goes to Tibet to the High Plains and works with the nomads and their yaks and he is quite a, an expert on fibres. And he said, contrary to popular belief, not all cashmere yarns, 100% cashmere yarns, pill. And what causes the pilling is when they use uh, the shortcut fibres. And very top quality cashmere yarns will not use these shortcut fibres because that's what causes the pilling. I found that quite fascinating. And he said it's the same with the yak. I'd asked him that question thinking about the yak and I and I do want to confirm with you that my my yak cardigan that I knitted not very long ago um, with the Noragon pattern I wear it all the time and I've even worn it hiking which is a little bit naughty this is all true <laughs> <laughs> once I make something I tend to wear it all the time whether or not yeah. it's appropriate but um, there is not a single peel on it. it. I am so thrilled with it. It is. It's really true. It does not peel, and that's fantastic. So um, I can just highly recommend that to you if you're a bit like me and have, <laughs> have this aversion. But um, he only said it about cashmere and yak. He didn't say it about wool. But I do remember... Uh, using super fine merino wool and it not peeling even after a lot of wear. So I'm sort of thinking that it's probably the case in that for that as well and that I'm coming to this conclusion that there is a lot of technical specialised knowledge in really producing really top class yarns. And um, 
It was interesting to read that this yarn here is produced in a Yorkshire spinning mill that's 200 years old and they specialize in spinning cashmere. So this yarn looks to be like it's going to be just like the Mayak. It's not going to peel at all. It looks completely beautiful quality. So I am very thrilled with that. And I have actually already wet blocked it, even though I haven't finished knitting because I wanted to make sure that the fit was going to work. I'm sick of picking, <laughs> ripping out. I just <laughs> wanted to have one project that was easy. And it is working out well. So, But I did wet block it. And I did what um, Louisa recommended, which is to put in a little bit of wool wash and that removes the excess oil from the, from the yarn. And the yarn just totally softened up and bloomed up and sort of became lighter and fuller. So that's really interesting. It's very beautiful, very drapey, and I, I love it. It's, it's really great. So I've done almost no modifications on this and it, as I said it's proving to be incredibly fast and easy so touch wood it'll continue like that yeah. but it's it's an interesting design to talk about because you can see there's got these very large lace motifs I call them a leaf shape this is what makes it quite a challenge to grade into different sizes and if you have a look at the, a picture of the final finished design here you can see that the lace motifs have been perfectly placed around the raglan shaping so there's no um, half motives they just all sit there really beautifully but each lace motif is around seven centimeters wide which means that the difference between each size is going to be around 14 to 15 centimeters because if you take out one motive from the front and one motive out the back that's the difference so therefore the pattern only has three sizes but nevertheless there's still a lot of give and flexibility in a large lace pattern like this and I think with a bit of stretch each size would probably be suitable for at least a couple of sizes depending on how fitted you'd want the lace to look on you so my true size actually fell bang in the middle of size one and size two. So the gauge is 19 stitches and 26 rows. And this is where doing a gauge swatch is incredibly important. I chose to do a gauge of 20.5 stitches. This is for 10 centimeters or four inches. And then took the stitch count of the larger size, size two. And that gave me the exact width that I wanted. So that was directly in between size one and size two. Did you use a different needle size? Yeah. Yeah. The needle size is not important. It's really just yeah. the gauge that's... No, but it's the means to changing the gauge. Yeah. Or yeah. you knit tighter. Or, I mean, the recommended needle is just somewhere to start with. You yep. start on that one and then you can alter... So I was, of course, a little bit worried to see whether my row gauge was out, and, but it was only out a half a row. So instead of 26 rows, I had 25 and a half. But like I said, because this is really flexible, you can easily block that out. And the way Louisa placed these leaf motifs, you've got exactly sort of three um, that, that covers the depth of the armhole where the raglan shaping is. So that all worked out really well. So I'm thrilled. So just to um, remind you, it, first of all, you knit four pieces. The front and the back, which I've done up to the armholes, is the front and the back. They're exactly the same. There's no shaping in the waist. But it's a very drapey garment, so it doesn't need uh, shaping because it just sort of falls around your body. So there they are there. And then two sleeves so there's one sleeve that's been blocked and here's another sleeve that's not quite finished and hasn't been blocked so you can see the difference in the material between blocked and unblocked and once you've done that so the sleeves you do up to the armholes as well and then you put all four pieces on a circular needle and knit the yoke up with the raglan shaping and then at the end you sew up the underarm seams on the sleeves and the body so it's very straightforward I did do some modification on the sleeve though. I don't sort of get away with out tampering <laughs> in some way with the pattern. What I wanted to do, because the sleeve doesn't have any um, shaping in it at all, it's just a straight up and down. And I wanted to, to taper it a little bit, but it is a lot harder to actually um, 
increase in a lace pattern than it is to decrease in a lace pattern. And if I was to start on and change and do increasing, I'd have to start actually sort of halfway on this sort of already decreased leaf shape. And that was just too difficult for me to sit down. I didn't want to spend the time doing that. So I cheated. I uh, knitted the first four pattern repeats in a much smaller needle size. So the body and upper arms is 4.5 millimeter and I did 3.75 millimeter on the first four and then I went up to four millimeter and then up to 4.5. And the important thing is, is that the patterns the pattern on the upper sleeve matches exactly with the pattern on the bodice and that's what the eye is going to pick up. It's not going to pick up what goes on down here. But I did have to add in an extra pattern repeat to make sure that the sleeves would be long enough. So there we go. It's going to be a very elegant and sexy top actually. Crikey. And Yeah. And at the moment I don't really have anything to wear underneath it. So I thought I might sew myself a little camisole. And if you have a look at the two yarns up close, here's, here's a picture for you. You can see that they're two strands or two different colors plied together. And in the darker yarn, it's a maroon plied together with a sort of gray brown color, which is very unique and beautiful. So hopefully I can find myself some of that gray brown in some satiny material and I'll sew myself a camisole and maybe I'll be sitting here wearing both next episode. So Andrea, I think we could have a change of scenery for a moment. We're going to take you to meet Ronnie at Oradale Farm, which is near Scalloway, a very beautiful and ancient city on Shetland. It used to be the capital of Shetland, actually. One thing to bear in mind while you're watching this is that not all sheep on Shetland are purebred and that native or the ancient native breed of Shetland sheep. Yeah. Um, Ronnie's sheep are very much purebred, ancient breed. And you can see this in the size of the sheep. They're much smaller than the typical sheep. And yeah. also there's a really large variety of colours there. So that's really interesting. Yeah, there were, so, there were some piebald ones. Yeah. You know, little different spots and things. Yep. Yeah. Yep. So enjoy this interview. We'll be right back. Welcome to Fruity Knitting. We're at Uradale Farm on the west side of Shetland's mainland and with me is farm owner Ronnie Janssen. Uradale Farm is a very popular destination for knitters during the Shetland Wool Week. Tours that the farm are consistently booked out. This is partly because the farm specialises in only Shetland breeds of sheep and cattle and it produces its own yarn, but it's also because Ronnie puts on a pretty good show for the knitters. Today, Ronnie's going to tell us about his life as a Shetland farmer, and he's also going to show us some of the beautiful organic yarns that he produces from his flock. Thanks for inviting us to Uradal Farm, and welcome to Fruity Knitting. Welcome. Tell us about yourself. Are you Shetland born and bred yourself? Are you, have you always been a farmer? And then tell us a little bit about your farm and uh, maybe the stock that you keep here. Well, uh, I'm now 60 years old, so I'm no spring chicken. 
but I was born and brought up uh, in Shetland. Uh, my father uh, came from Fair Isle between Orkney and Shetland. My mother came from Walsa, an island on the east coast of Shetland. And I was brought up in Lerwick, uh, but always hankered after uh, either the sea or the land. I always wanted to go either to the fishing or to, to, to be a farmer. And uh, because of my um, seasickness, I ended up being uh, a farmer. Mm -hmm. So uh, here we are. Yeah, but I did hear it wasn't a direct path to farming. I think you did study. Yeah, no, I, I spent a few years at Edinburgh University uh, studying linguistics mm -hmm. and uh, did Old Norse and uh, a few other uh, dead languages. And... Uh, it was really not for me. I found uh, academic life was uh, uh, not exciting enough. I hankered after doing uh, things a bit more exciting with my life. Saved up a little bit of money and, and uh, bought some bits of land and started off with 15 acres. And now we cover uh, just, well, coming on for 2,000 acres. Okay. And I know around the year 2000, you made big changes to the running of the farm. So you converted to only native Shetland breeds mm. and you also converted the farm to be fully organic. Yeah. Can you, can you tell us why you did that and, and what it was like, this transition? Well, partly I suppose it was one of these sort of midlife crises uh, where you start to reevaluate what you've been doing over the, the course of your lifetime. Previously, we'd been doing exactly the same as other farmers in Shetland. Um, working with uh, large uh, modern type breeds um, and uh, I decided that I didn't think this was the way ahead and uh, I decided that what we needed to do was make the, the whole uh, system here much more sustainable. Mm -hmm. um, part of that plan was to, to go back to the ancient breeds of Shetland sheep and Shetland cattle um, and to try to develop markets for them. Yeah. But it was all done as a, um, a means of trying to make the uh, family business more sustainable. Well, the Shetland breed uh, is obviously uh, a fairly uh, ancient type of sheep. Uh, they're of the, what they call the northern short-tailed variety, so you find the same breeds in... Uh, the um, Hebrides of Scotland, Faroe, Iceland, the west coast of Norway. Um, here in Shetland, the examples of the breed are found in uh, the archaeological remains dating back to 5,000 years ago. So it's a, a small breed of sheep, very light boned. Um, it uh, has uh, an ability to live in this place. Uh, which has developed over that period of time. Similar to the cattle, they, they, the breed has evolved to cope with the challenges, the natural challenges of the place. Uh, what you find is a, a breed that's multicolored. Of course, the white sheep uh, tend to be uh, much more modern type um, because the spinners and processors want white wool. Um, then it tends to have led to a situation when I started in agriculture, you had to go up onto the hilltops and the outer islands to find the coloured sheep. And uh, so that has uh, altered in the last few years since we've started to um, find that Netters are particularly interested in natural and unbleached, undyed um, yarns, uh, which I guess the sheep are very uh, happy about because uh, now they can revert to a colour that's uh, much more natural to them. Yeah. Um, so the over the course of the last hundred or so years, uh, a modern type has been developed, which... Uh, exhibits very very fine wool. The old breed was uh, and still is double coated so um, it had a, a harder outer coat of hair which uh, gave it physical protection from the wind and the rain. That has been braided out of the breed in an effort to make the wool 
consistent in uh, fineness from the head to the tail. Mm -hmm. um, problem comes that uh, these types are uh, not as uh, um, comfortable in some of the harder uh, areas of Shetland. So the, my particular uh, farming policy is to maintain a diversity of genetics. Yeah. What we're looking at is uh, uh, a breed that we keep enough gem genetic strains that allow it to um, be able to feel comfortable both on the sweeter green land uh, and on the hilltops as well. Yeah. So, Ronnie, tell us about the production process of the yarns. I imagine it's shearing and then grading the wools and what, what... Well, what we do is we start clipping around July time and we start with low ground sheep first because uh, the, the rise in the wool tends to come earlier there. Um, and the rise is where the, the, the fibre is growing all the time uh, from the fleece, uh, from the skin and out. And uh, if there's no rise in the wool, then it makes it very, very difficult for to, for to get the machine clippers through it. And uh, in days gone by, then the sheep would have been rude, as we say here in Shetland, which was where the fleece was plucked off. But there's rise in the wool, uh, there's a, a weakness in the fibre there, which allows the fibre to snap, and so the wool naturally shades off. So when I, uh, after the shearing is finished, then uh, I then have to sort through all the fleeces. And we sort out for uh, murids, blacks, greys, whites. And then we have different grades in each colour, such that uh, we can then uh, grade out the wool for jumper weight, double knit, iron or chunky, whatever. Um, it's a, a question of, take an assessment of each fleece and deciding whether maybe the whole fleece can go into one grade or maybe you're looking at splitting the fleece into maybe three different grades and then that all gets bagged up um, uh, prior to being shipped away for uh, scoring which we usually do in the, in, in the springtime and uh, that scoring obviously Everything we do has to have an organic link in the chain so that the scorer has to be organically certified, the spinners organically certified, the dyers organically certified. All this is done through the Soil Association. And that means that we have total traceability right from the balls of yarn right back through to the sheep themselves. So that's very important as far as uh, our customers are concerned because they want to see that um, what they're buying is, is actually what it is. Uh, there's really far too much mixing and matching of fibres in this day and age. And I think that there is a body of customers out there who appreciate the fact that uh, they can buy a product from Shetland and actually know what it is. So we tend to do a range of natural, undyed, unbleached colours, which of course every year will vary to a degree because the blacks and the murets and the greys, they all will have subtle differences from year to year uh, depending on what the weather is and what the style of the sheep are for that particular season. And then we do a range of uh, organically dyed uh, wools which we... Uh, uh, the colours we choose are meant to reflect the plants and vegetation uh, in the valley in on the hills so that everything is given uh, a name of uh, um, the dyed colours get names of plants whereas the unbleached, undyed yarns get much more uh, physical names and so that the greys get a series of names uh, describing waves, parts of waves. Mm -hmm. uh, the Eskimos have, uh, goodness knows how many names for snow, uh, the colour white. Uh, well, we've got a lot of different names for grey. Uh, 
So yeah. uh, that's that's pretty much what we do. Okay. Do you want to take a couple of uh, examples here from the coloured yarns? Yeah. Well, this is unbleached, undyed white. Yep. It's it's not the the sort of slightly uh, lurid uh, white that uh, sometimes we see in uh, modern knitwear, and so that going through the different greys and into the murret, um, we can see that there's subtle changes and people seem to appreciate these uh, subtle changes uh, when they come to blend uh, ya uh, yarns uh, to, to, to uh, uh, when they're knitting their uh, garments. They like to be able to jump between greys and dyed and so what we've done uh, is to uh, over dye onto some of these uh, natural colours to get uh, coloured yarn with much more depth and, uh, and, uh, and character. This is the one that we call First Club. It's a very fine yarn that we uh, had made last year as a, a little experiment to try uh, knitting a, a finer yarn from the one-year-old sheep. So this, this we simply call it first clip. It, yep. uh, I suppose other people would call it lamb's wool. Uh, we choose the fleeces carefully from the sheep when they're first clipped for fineness. Um, and we get quite a, there's a good staple length on the sheep when they're one year old. So it's, uh, it's made a very nice, very nice soft yarn. So just, we're heading towards the end now, but I wanted to ask you, I always feel like there's quite a, a big separation between producers like yourself, you're working on the land with the animals, um, very amongst the weather here, you know, in contact with the elements and people really like me who are in the city, consumers, um, there's, there's a, a big separation between the two parts of the population. And are there any sort of ideas or, or messages that you'd like to put out just to give people a better understanding of, of the farmer's life and, and work? Well, what I tend to do since we have pursued this particular direction is to invite customers, consumers to actually express their feelings directly to us. The, so much of modern agriculture, uh, all forms of modern agricultural production are uh, anonymous as far as consumers are concerned and they often get uh, concerned about methods of production. What we do here at Oradell is invite people to come and see the production themselves and uh, to make their own judgment but on the basis that they see what things are and they can choose whether they appreciate them or not, because uh, the, the, the experience we want them to have is much more intimate yeah. and to be able to relate it back to a place and a person and so, to some shape. Yep, yep. Okay, so really bring in some understanding and a lot of transparency on the whole process from the, from the sheep right up to the finished yarns. I like to think that that's, that's our future is in being able to make people see who we are and what we do. Yep. Okay. Well, Ronnie, it's been a real pleasure to speak to you today at Uradale Farm. So thank you very much for inviting us out here. And You're welcome. Yep. Uh, it's been a pleasure having you. Great. So we're going to head out with Ronnie and take a look at some of these sheep. And we're also going to get a closer look at some of the fleeces that are produced. What I like to explain to people is uh, the difference between the very traditional and historic fleeces of Shetland sheep. Uh, Shetland sheep are a double coated variety. So they have long guard hairs that hang down around the flanks and around the rear ends. And underneath they have the soft thermal layer. And in days gone by, the ladies would have carded this to take all the long guard hairs out to make a different type of yarn from the soft inner yarn, which would have been used for um, garments for closer to the skin. And during the 20th century, they developed this type of fleece from this, um, which is very consistent and uniform from the head to the tail, whereas the old type of fleece was not. 
it had v significant changes within the wool type from um, one part of the fleece to another. So this type of animal likes to live on the lowland. Uh, at Uradale we have uh, the green fields which are generally along the coast and uh, where the previous generations have uh, cultivated the land. Whereas this type of sheep uh, with the double coat lives mostly up on the hilltops, which are uh, by and large peatland uh, covered in heather and mountain grasses. So you see that there's two types of sheep here, one that prefers the low ground, one that prefers the higher ground. And uh, they're pretty much uh, determined by uh, mineral deficiencies. Um, the, the softer fleeced sheep uh, prefer to have uh, uh, access to minerals, whereas the older type of sheep are much more acclimatized to the peatlands and the minerally deficient areas. So given that this uh, modern type is uh, snowy white uh, because the spinners prefer to be able to dye things any color they want, um, the rest of the natural shades that we uh, find among Shetland sheep um, are from the murret through the various greys uh, right through to the Shetland black, which is not a true black, it's a, a, a sort of chocolate uh, black, it's a brownie black. And uh, if it wasn't for uh, netters expressing their preferences for natural colour snows nowadays, most of these older shades would have vanished altogether. So I think from the sheep's perspective, um, they like the fact that netters are taking an interest in them. So, Dals, I thought I did a pretty good job of that. Are you feeling at all threatened in your position as chief interviewer? Yeah. <laughs> no, actually, I was really relieved because we had such a lot of interviews lined up. I was really happy to have a break, be on the other side of the camera and let you have a go. <laughs> yeah, well, I was relieved after I was finished. Were you? <laughs> yeah, totally. Uh, Ronnie has kindly offered Fruity Knitting patrons a 10% discount off all of his purebred organic Shetland yarns. So patrons, if after seeing the interview you're really excited to try out his yarns, you can head over to the Patreon site to get the details. And big thank you to Ronnie for that offer. And you may also remember the interview that we did with Ursa Tricosa back in episode 58. And Ursa has recently published a book all about her ziggurat method, which is a very innovative method of top-down and completely seamless design and sweater design. And in the interview, Ursa gave us a very detailed step-by-step -step guide showing exactly how to do her method. And many of you made some comments saying that you were very inspired to try it. Well, we have a live event organised with Ursa for our Shetland patrons coming up on Sunday, the 25th of November. So this will be a lot of fun and very informative. So Shetlands and Merinos, please send in your questions so that I can get them to Ursa as soon as possible, because this is your chance to personally ask her all the questions about this really interesting method. So Andrew, why aren't you knitting on my socks? Because Andrea, I've finished it. Have you? Yes. Here it is. You've been working yeah, look, on them. Oh, you can okay. take the first one. Let me drag out the second one here. I'm sitting on the needle. There it is, dolls. One finished sock. Except I've finished. I have to get by on a technicality again. I've finished the knitting, and I still have some some kitchener stitch to do. And I was going to get into the kitchener stitch with the help of our little piece of paper, but. I wasn't confident of doing it on live international television just in case I got it wrong because <laughs> I can't concentrate on too many things at the same That's time. That's really cool. So you actually managed to finish them yes. in two episodes. Yes. That's a, a record. That is absolutely a record. There they are again. They look really beautiful. They do look very beautiful. Do you know, something I noticed, I think they look really good. Something I did notice is that I am knitting on, what is it, 2.75 millimetre no, needles? No, 2.25. 2.25 millimetre yeah. needles, so exactly half the size of yours. 
Yes. And it does take quite a long time to go round and round. Um, I did sort of take the opportunity to try and improve my technique. And something I realised in doing that is a lot of what I need to do, and this is based on your advice, is relax about stuff and, and just hang on to everything less tightly, right? And, and also hang on to the material rather than hang on to the needle with the left hand. Mm. And it's really counterintuitive and unsettling. Is it? Yeah. <laughs> and I do actually notice that when I do it, I do tend to make more mistakes. We got two stitches on my needle there before. I'm pretty sure that that was associated with that. I don't know how that happened exactly. Anyway. You just good. want to use the least amount of effort yeah. to be most efficient. That's how I try to get through life. <laughs> um, yeah, anyway, I, it's good practice and I enjoyed it. I enjoy this bit too at the heel where you do the, the alternating knit and slip. Yeah. That's really fun. That's yeah. quite fast. So, <laughs> it yeah. is, isn't and it? I'm, I'm always amazed and impressed at my, um, what do you call it, heel flap and gusset and the, the lines that you get here. It's yeah, really good. It is. So after the show... We'll finish the kitchen a stitch. Definitely. With a little bit of guidance. And then you have two sock styles. I know. Yeah. That's amazing. And I love them. And the yarn was a gift from Jill. So thank you very much, yeah. Jill. And it's the Bendigo Woolen Mill. Yeah. And I've enjoyed knitting with that. It's. And I really need another pair of socks. Oh, you really need another I pair do. of socks. Yeah. So I'm, I'm, sure. I'm I do. So Just, I'm super yeah. happy for them. Thank you. Good. But you have been knitting on the swatch, haven't so you? So we have to talk now. about that. Yes. So here's this extraordinarily bright blue yarn that's in Aran weight that you must be thinking, my goodness, what's this going to be? Well, it's going, we bought the yarn at Jamieson's and Smith when we were in the Shet, there for the Shetland Wool Week. And it's going to be a, uh, a sort of a, a hiking jacket for me. So you might yeah. remember that Andrew knitted himself a hiking jacket with a zipper and it had some intarsia panels up here, which you wear all the time. Yep. Well, I kind of, I've been wearing a, a fleece jacket when we go up in Snowdonia, sort of in the same colour actually as this. And yeah. I would like to replace it with a really thick, warm uh, jacket. So that's what we bought this yarn for. And I've been thinking about how to do a design that Andrew can knit because <laughs> I thought it'd be good for him to do some cables and then I get excited about cables and I want to put this one and that one together. And I think, uh, is Andrew going <laughs> to want to knit it? Yeah. So, but it's, it's basically... Remember, Madeline and I had a little fight over the Carbeth, who was going to get the Carbeth, and she won. But I really uh, loved... And now she's been thrown out of the house. So. <laughs> <laughs> no, she hasn't. She's moved to Ulm, for those of you who may be wondering, yeah. doing her university degree. She's studying psychology. So she's very happy, uh, but we don't get to see her that often. But she will be coming to Snowdonia with us over Christmas, which is brilliant. So you'll get to see her then. Anyway... So I really liked the beautiful, even, to me, the carbeth that we knitted in that bright orange with the zipper up the front. It just looked so 60s, like a classical 60s, 60s yeah. top. And I sort of want that with this, this sort of bright, solid colour with a zipper, very plain and um, functional. And so that's what I'm going to do. And I'm just trying to figure out how I'm going to do it so there's the least amount of ripping back because Andrew can't handle too much ripping back. So I'm, I'm, the first step, of course, is, is to do a swatch, a big enough swatch, so that we've got a really true gauge on, on what the, the tension's going to be like. And you can see this is quite tight, but I want it tight because when you're out in the freezing cold, you don't want wind whipping through loose stitches. You want it as, as windproof as possible. And it can be thick, you know, and yeah. so that's what Andrea actually started this swatch. So these first rows are from you. Yeah. And the later ones from me. Yeah. So I want to see how different your knitting is than mine is. Looks also, pretty consistent to me. Yeah, but I reckon yours is a little looser. Could be. We don't want you to go too loose. I don't want you to go too loose. And it's a bit loose. So just try to tighten up on the pearl rows. That would be the pearl, yeah. Yeah. So, but I, I won't do raglan shaping. I think I'm just going to do set in sleeve and a zipper and a, a similar collar to what I did on um, the Carbeth. Carbeth, you know, so doubled over that is actually the design doubled over and a zipper right up the top I love I love the zipper I don't think I'll put in any pockets because I don't put my hands 
in my pockets of, of my um, knitted garments. Oh, okay. Yeah, I, I won't put them in there. So this kind of, the most I would put in is a tissue. So maybe I would, but I don't really use pockets that way. So hopefully I'll have that designed and um, something to show you next episode. But are you excited about that? Yeah. Yeah, it's Sounded different. too strong a word. No, 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 no. Um, it's really different. It's it's interesting going to this yarn and these needles after doing the socks on two point two five. I know it's a big change, yeah. but that's also good practice. So. Yeah, that's good. But you do. I do want. And don't want you to get sloppy in this. It's not sloppy. Yeah, not it's even a little bit sloppy. Yeah. Okay. Right. Cool. <laughs> My name is Diana Walla and I'm a knitwear designer currently living in Montreal, Quebec. Uh, I've been designing for about six years, but knitting has been a big part of my life for at least twice that long. Um, I think I have a similar story to a lot of people. My mother taught me to knit when I was a child, but it didn't really stick at the time, and I set it aside for a while. But towards the end of high school, I decided to come back to knitting, and by college, I was knitting all the time. Um, I've always been very interested in stranded color work. Even before I could really knit, I loved looking at stranded color work, even ready to wear. Um, so once I learned to knit color work myself, it definitely really took over my knitting. Um, I do knit other things, but stranded color work is my, my real joy and it's something that I always come back to. Um, within that, I'm very fond of traditional Norwegian knitting in particular. Um, that's something you can see not only in my own designs, but also in the, the designs I choose to knit for myself from other people's patterns. Um, I lived in Norway for two years while I did a master's degree, but I've had an affinity for Norway for a lot longer than that, and I think that my love of Norwegian knitting has definitely strengthened my affinity for Norway overall. So the first piece I want to share with you is actually a two-parter. Um, this sweater here was the first sweater I uh, knit without using a pattern. I knit it just for myself back in 2010. Um, I couldn't find what I was looking for in a pattern, so I thought I'll just make up one myself. But I was so happy with how it turned out that I decided I wanted to write it up into a pattern eventually. Um, so three years later, uh, that happened, thanks to Brooklyn Tweed. Um, I reworked some elements of the pattern to make it easier to grade for different sizes, and that was this version here was the result. Um, so we used their worsted weight shelter. Um, it's a seamless bottom up yoke. So you knit the sleeves in the body, you join them all together. There are short rows worked both before and after the color work to make the neck fit better. Um, and it's a pretty simple piece to knit. It was one of my earlier garment patterns. Um, but it's also been one of my most successful. So it gives me so much joy to know that a simple sweater that I knit just for myself to begin with is able to become a design that so many other people are able to enjoy. Next up is another sweater I designed that is pretty obviously influenced by Norwegian knitting. This is Ebba, a pattern I did for the American yarn company Quince & Co. Um, and it's really different um, in terms of construction compared with Sundaughter because Sundaughter is a yoke and Ebba features drop sleeves. So this is also a seamless sweater knit in the round, and that means that you use steeks to um, create the armholes. The core wool line of Quince & Co is all non-superwash, um, so I was able to just do a crochet reinforcement on these armholes before cutting them open. And then once you've done that, you're able to pick up stitches for the sleeves and they're knit down from there. Um, I'm very fond of this sweater, and one of my favorite details is that the flower motif in the main band of color work is actually based on my engagement ring, which is a family ring. And that's part of why I called the sweater Ebba, because that was the middle name of my husband's grandmother, and she was the daughter of a Norwegian immigrant and a Swedish immigrant. One of the things that I love most about Norwegian knitting is um, Selbu mittens, the iconic black and white mittens from the uh, region of Selbu outside of Trondheim. 
Um, there are a lot of design elements that are typical of this style of mitten, uh, and I love playing around with design within that framework. So this pair of mittens is one that I wear all winter long. Uh, they're knit with Rauma Finol, which is um, a wool yarn that is spun in Norway from Norwegian wool, and I've knit it at a pretty tight gauge here, so these wear really well. Um, I knit these mittens when I got into my graduate program in Norway, and the motif on the back of the hand of the ravens actually comes from the old university seal of the University of Tromsø. They are Hugen and Munen, the ravens of Odin, the Norse god. Um, some of the typical elements of Selbu mittens in these particular mittens here that you can see are there's a different pattern on the back of the hand compared with the palm. You have a very strong border between the two sides, and you also have a thumb gusset worked into the palm side of the mitten. Um, I never wrote a pattern for this particular pair of mittens because it was specific to my university, but I am working on a set of mitten designs that use the sort of same elements that I have here of the branches surrounding the ravens and some of the little sparkles and things. And I think that those mittens are going to have a much broader appeal. So I'm looking forward to that. Even though I'm a designer, it's personally very important to me to take time to knit things for myself from other people's patterns. So I wanted to share a couple of my favorite examples of those. Um, so first up is the my Selbu socks. And this is a pattern by Ellie of Skandir Knits. She's a Norwegian living in London. And Ellie's aim with this design was to come up with a sock pattern that shared some of the characteristics of typical Selbu mittens. Ellie is from Trondheim, which is the same part of Norway as Selbu, um, so she has a strong relationship with that knitting tradition. So what she did with these is she created a design where you have a different um, pattern happening on the bottom of the foot compared with the top of the foot, you have the strong border in between, and you also have a gusset worked into the color work. Uh, I think they're very beautiful. Um, I just used hand-dyed sock yarns for these myself. Um, but I picked up one of my most useful tips for stranded color work in socks, um, which is that I used a different needle size for the foot than I did for the leg. Because one of the problems people have with stranded socks is that it's hard to get their heel through the leg of the foot because it's not as stretchy as a typical sock. Um, so what I did, these are toe up, and I actually I worked the foot on my typical sock needle size. I usually use 2.25 millimeter. And then when I got to the leg, I switched to a 2.5. So it's just a little bit bigger, but it's a lot easier for me to get my foot through um, that part of the sock. And that's definitely something I'm going to use in the future when I knit more stranded socks. Lastly, we have my sunless kofta. Um, this is another Norwegian pattern. It's from a book called Fertitun Norske Kofter, and a kofta in Norwegian knitting is a certain type of traditional colorwork cardigan. Um, I made some serious modifications to this pattern. Um, first of all, the pattern calls for fingering weight yarn. I chose to use Buchilia from Kate Davies, which is more of a heavy sport DK weight, so it's a much thicker yarn. Um, I knitted at a pretty tight gauge. Um, so my, my gauge isn't too far off from the pattern gauge, but it's still enough that I had to do some math to figure out um, what size I should be following the directions for in order to get the dimensions that I wanted. Um, the other big change that I made is that the pattern is a crew neck cardigan and I turned it into a v-neck cardigan. So I, again, had to do some math to determine at what point I should start decreasing for the v-neck and at what rate I needed to decrease. And it was really crucial with this pattern to figure that all out in advance because it's knit in the round and there are steaks for the front opening and the sleeves. So I wasn't able to try it on until I cut it open. Um, so it needed to be right. I, uh, like I said, I used the Buchia from Kate Davies. It's made with Scottish wool from Shetland sheep and Cheviot sheep. And um, it's a really wonderful yarn for steaking. I like it a lot. Um, the sleeves on this one are knit separately and then seamed in after the fact. Um, so unlike Ebba, which is the same shoulder construction, on Ebba you pick up for your sleeve and knit downward seamlessly. Um, with this pattern, they're knit separately and then you seam them on afterwards. Um, but it's one of the warmest sweaters I own and I really love it. I hope you enjoyed hearing about some of my favorite knits and my love for stranded color work. And thank you so much to Andrea and Andrew for having me.
you very much to Diana. If you'd like to catch a little bit more of Diana, she has her very own YouTube channel called Paper Tiger. You can check that out and she's got a lot of really good advice on stranded colour work. Yeah, she's done some really great stranded colour work jumpers and cowls and hats and gloves. She's got a great selection. And Diana has offered Fruity Knitting patrons a discount of 25% off all of her self-published patterns. And we do have a mitts and gloves cowl running at the moment. It's going right up to Christmas Day. So if you'd like to join in and you don't yet have a pattern, then you might want to head over and check out of some of Diana's patterns. And we want to remind you of both of our cows, which both of them are running up to Christmas Day and the finished objects threads are filling up with fantastic pictures of, of all of these finished gloves and garments and things. But so while I'm just um, telling you again what the cows are, I'm going to put up some of the photos of these finished items for you to look at and to motivate you. So the first cowl is the Fruity Gloves and Mitts cowl. And for this one, you can enter as many times as you like and you should be able to complete your Christmas knitting list by doing that. And you can see that there's a lot of different types of gloves and they're all acceptable. So you can have full gloves, full fingered gloves, traditional mitts, you can have fingerless mitts and fingerless gloves. You can do them plain or patterned or stranded in any weight of yarn that you like and also any size that you like. So you could knit for a baby, a child or an adult. It's a very open curl. The second cowl is called Knit for Your Man and that man doesn't have to be your partner or even a big man. It's for any wonderful man in your life, whether it's your grandson, your brother, your father, your neighbour or a partner or if you are a man, you can knit for yourself. It has to be a garment, so that means a sweater, cardigan, vest or jacket. And as you can see, there's some really brilliant versions already finished in the thread. So we've been showing you these photos to really motivate you so that if you haven't joined in one of the cows, you might want to join in. There's still plenty of time right up to Christmas. Or if you did join in and you're a little bit in a slump, it'll make you get cracking with your project to finish it in time. Now, there's also one more thing that we're really grateful and happy to announce. And that's back in episode 61, we interviewed Nora Gon, who is best known for her very innovative and beautiful cable designs. And after seeing this interview, Kay and Anne from Mason and Dixon Knitting have offered Fruity Knitting patrons a 15% discount on their latest field guide, number nine, which is called Revolution. And that's because it features a collection of Noragon's designs. There's a cardigan and sweater design with really stunning cables around the yoke, but also a cabled beret and a cowl or capelet kind of design that you can wear under a coat. They're all really unique, beautiful cable designs and three of the cable motifs are interchangeable. So you can mix and match patterns and garments if you want. So the discount is on the printed and the ebook version. So patrons, you can find the details for that at the patron site. So these patron discounts are one way for us to thank our patrons for their ongoing financial support. As we say, every, every episode, it's a huge amount of work to consistently put out this program, which we do really want to keep doing but we do need the financial support to make it viable for us to do this long term. So we do ask you if you are watching regularly and you really enjoy the show to please become a patron. You can do so for a small amount. Thank you. Before we jump into the interview on Tattered Rugs with Carol Christensen, I wanted to mention two things. The first one is the Shetland Museum and Archives has been donated two quite significant collections of lace garments and Carol does show us a selection of garments from these collections towards the end of this interview and that's really beautiful. Yeah. The other thing I did want to mention is the music which Andrea has selected to go with this, uh, this piece, this interview, because in talking about the, the tattered rugs, we get a little bit of exposure to Shetland folklore, which is very much based on Norwegian folklore. The music that Andrea chose is by the Norwegian composer Edvard Grieg. It's the Pia Gint Suite, which was written to accompany the play by Henrik Ibsen. And in this play, uh, Pia Gint has to rescue uh, three milk maidens from the horrible trolls. So, <laughs> since that's there the was connection. A, yeah, and there was a lot. There's a lot of talk about witches and trolls in the interview, and trolls are, or Norwegian 
fairy tales are full of trolls, so I thought this is just the perfect music. Yeah, so, so that's what you've got to look forward to. Thank you very much for being with us today. We've had a lot of fun. We'll see you in two weeks' time. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Welcome to Fruity Knitting. I'm in Shetland for the Wool Week and with me here today is Dr. Carol Christensen who is the curator of the Shetland Museum and Archives and we interviewed Carol last year for the 2017 Wool Week and she kindly agreed to be interviewed again which is brilliant. So welcome Carol and thanks so much for agreeing. Thanks for having me. <laughs> So Carol led a research project into the history of Shetland's tattered rugs, which culminated into this fantastic book, which was published in 2014. So just to let you know, if you don't know or if you haven't heard of tattered rugs, a tattered rugs are heavy woolen piled rugs that were used as bed covers in Shetland from at least the 18th century onwards. And um, through studying these rugs, Carol was able to learn a lot more about early textile practices in, in Shetland in general, but also because they have such a domestic purpose, she was also able to find out a lot about the ordinary lives of Shetlanders in the 18th and 19th century, which is also very fascinating, isn't it? Mm, yeah. Yeah. So I thought we'd start off with just a little bit of history. Um, could you also include how they were made, how they were used, and also if they have a connection in some, some way or they can be compared with similar Nordic rugs? Sure. Uh, the oldest rug we discovered during the research um, dates to about 1780s, and it's still in private hands. Um, but we have about 40 or 50 now, we, about 50 in the collection. Um, we were donated some rugs during the course of the research. Um, they are a pile rug. They're... Um, you can see that on one side there's this pile fabric. On the other side, it's smooth. And the way they're made is that they are, uh, they have a ground fabric which is woven, generally plain weaving, tabby weaving, um, and it's woven in, a, in one long strip that's rather narrow. So this is a half of a rug that you see. And um, this is the loom width that they were working with. This is typical because they had rather small looms. And um, so the ground fabric was woven in one long strip, and then it was cut in half. And these pieces of pile yarns, uh, threads called tats, were sewn on afterward. And then the two pieces were sewn together. And then... Um, when they needed to clean the rug, because they were so heavy, they actually divided that seam just for that purpose, washed the two halves separately and dried them, and then they sewed them back together again. Now, when they used them on a bed, generally the tat side was, uh, was the other way. So what you saw was this side, the smooth side. And this would have been... Um, warmer for the people sleeping under it um, and probably a little bit lighter just because it gave you this cushion of air in between yeah so your so in other words this section here is half of the middle and then there's a border around the edge yes this one has a border of which most of them do have borders um, but not all uh, there's quite a variety of designs in them but there are some typical um, similar designs as well. And what about, what were they made out of? All Shetland wool? All Shetland wool, all hand spun and either using natural color or dyed colors. Okay. And so this was typically what you found in most um, households, was it? Or was it just sort of what we would call middle class or the very poor, did they have it as well? The very poor did not have it. In fact, a lot of the very poor didn't have any bedclothes whatsoever. And sometimes they didn't have beds. Um, 
but the people that had these generally were people that had crofts with enough sheep or enough family connections that they could get enough wool to make one of these because they take a lot of wool and you need to have enough sheep to produce that amount of wool. And of course, Shetland sheep are quite small, but also you're using wool for other things like knitting and your own clothes. And so yeah. you need, this is an extravagance in a way, but these um, rugs were meant to last a lifetime or more, which, you know, most, most of the time they did. They did, well, because we've still got them, haven't yeah. we? And they look like they're still very usable. So are they little loops? Is that what it is? It's sort of heavy spun wool that's done in loops. Yes, it's two ply and then two threads are used together and they're sewn with a fairly big needle with a, a large eye and that's just taken down and looped around several times and then it, they go again. So it's in a ball, it's in a continuous piece of yarn and then they're they're looped and looped. And have you actually seen repairs done on them or does it just do you just see that they actually when they were originally done they, they really lasted and didn't need a lot of repairing. There isn't a lot of repair. There's a lot of wear. And in fact, here you can see where the edge is, is um, frayed a bit. Sometimes you could tell that um, around these edges that um, people were sort of pulling on them or tugging on them. And probably that's at nighttime where they're trying to tug it up toward them. And it Sometimes with the double rugs, you can see that one side is being tugged more than the other. <laughs> Do you know what that is? That's when the partner is rolled over and pulled the bed. That's right. <laughs> the bed covers <Yes>. off. <laughs> I think we can still relate to that. Yeah. Okay. So, and they were given as heirlooms, weren't they? Often because they were, like you said, expensive. Took a long time to to make. So they were often as not given as heirlooms, given as wedding presents and things. Is that right? That's right. I mean. There was, there was this story about them before we started the research that they were given as marriage rugs um, and that one half was made by one family and the other half was made by the other. And then they sewed them together before the wedding and presented them to the young couple. We didn't really find that so much in the research. What we found was that um, in some cases brides made them for themselves in other cases, um, fathers made them for their their bride or rarely their groom. A lot of times we didn't know who made them. A lot of them were made by men, though, um, especially fishermen who, of course, had skills, sewing skills. They could make sails. Mm -hmm. They knew about ropes. Um, they maybe didn't do the spinning or the dyeing, but they did the sewing um, and perhaps had something to do with the design layout. So... We tried to record as much as possible who made them, um, and also because some of them were f made for marriages, that gave us dates, which was really important, and it gave us the names of families and, and couples that used them. So what can you tell us about the decoration? Were there typical kind of patterns or motifs used, and were the patterns in any way connected to Shetland folklore or myths? or? Well... Uh, very many of the rugs have borders, as I said, and in the borders um, typically are these crosses, which are um, what you might call equidistance crosses. They're not um, Christian crosses as such. They sometimes are described as Greek crosses, but these have nothing to do with Greece. This is a very, very old symbol um, across Europe, and... Um, I mean, today we we still see this symbol um, in very many places, but we don't always recognize what it means. But it really was a protection symbol. And today you find it in things like it's the symbol for the Red Cross, and yeah. it sometimes means a hospital. So it still has that, that connotation in our modern life. But in the past, it was considered a protection symbol um, in Shetland against trows, which are the, that's the Shetland word for trolls. And trows were mischievous creatures who, um, could cause you a lot of hassle, but also 
could be quite dangerous, but trows only were active at night, and that's when they came out and they could spoil foodstuffs. Um, they could um, kind of rearrange things in the house. Um, uh, they could just be quite mischievous, but they could also be very dangerous um, to human beings. So the fact that these are around the border suggested to me that these were to kind of keep trow activity away from the bed. So protection. Protection from trials, yes. Um, and the other symbol that you see um, on a lot of rugs, that, that there's often in the center of the rug are, are particular symbols. Um, a circle is another one that's quite common, and circles were used to protect you against witches. So, for example, if you came across a witch in the course of daily life, you might draw a circle around yourself to kind of create a barrier. And there are circles in the middle of rugs, generally. Mm -hmm. They're not usually in any other part, but only in the center. Is that a circle there in the no, corner? No, this is a checkerboard. Okay. And checkerboards are the third common symbol. Um, and this one has one in the center as well. Oh, yes. It's only half of one, but you can see it here. Yeah, so you've got the, the dark <coughs> pink or red there. Yes. And the white natural. Yes, yep. I did some research on checkerboards um, because they are really common in rugs. Now, of course, because Shetland was part of the Nordic world, the folklore of Shetland is very common, uh, has very many common elements with the folklore of Norway and Sweden. You see similar stories, but also similar behaviors of creatures or um, situations. And so what is recorded in Norway is that checkerboards were a symbol that, again, a protection symbol against a creature known as the Mara. And the Mara is a creature that comes and sits on your chest at night when you're asleep, it makes it difficult to breathe. And this is a actual affliction that is known today as sleep paralysis, and people are still affected by this. And generally what happens is you feel that your chest is being crushed and that you can't breathe, but you're conscious. Sometimes you can hear footsteps, um, and sometimes you feel as though there's a person in the room. So together, those, those feelings um, kind of culminated in folklore as a creature. In the Nordic world, the way that they, what they believed about the Mara was that that creature can't um, count beyond the number three. And so if you have something between you and it that has more than three elements to it, then it continually tries to count up to three and then it has to start all over again. And it continues to do this till it gets so fed up it goes away. And of course a checkerboard by definition has to have at least four elements. What an amazing story. <laughs> <laughs> so that I do think that because they're often in the center of the rug, I do believe that again, this is to protect you against a creature sitting on your chest because that's where this would be yeah. on you if yeah. you were underneath the rug. You must have come across some really interesting myths while you were checking it all out and, and reading up on it. Well, I did. Unfortunately, the, the folklore for Shetland is very limited. Um, there, there isn't that much recorded. But when you start to read the behaviors of people in opposition of these other elements, you start to understand sort of the psychology of people living really before the Age of Enlightenment mm -hmm. when they didn't look to science to, to understand mm -hmm. some of these issues. Yeah. So I'm just seeing the different colors that are used here. You did analysis on uh, the dyes, the natural dyes that were used. Did you find anything particularly interesting? We did do analysis because there, there is a lot of color in tattered rugs, and I'm actually of the belief that these were probably one of the most colorful things in the house. So again, there's an expense spared on these with putting dyes into, and a lot of dye, because they're big pieces mm -hmm. and the yarns there's you know they're thick yarns so indigo um 
blue is very common, and indigo is available in Shetland by about 1810. The rugs have an awful lot of it in it, um, but generally people bought smaller quantities for things like stripes and ferrule caps and that kind of thing. But, but this is a lot, isn't it? This is a lot of dye. And in fact, um, I even found um, the natural brown moret wool, sometimes dyed indigo to give a really fantastic charcoal color. Um, so they were using indigo even on natural colors um, of wool. The other um, dyes that were used um, were lichen dyes, and in this case, this is a, a, a lichen dye that was used for this um, color, this sort of magenta color. You can see it's a bit faded on the outside, but when you spread the tats, you can see that it, it was quite, um, well, quite a strong color, actually. When you look at that color there, and you can imagine it originally, it's very bright and beautiful, Very bright, isn't it? yeah. The other thing about this rug, which you probably wouldn't necessarily notice right away, is that this part is yellow. So you actually had... This, these are, this was dyed yellow, oh. and it's faded as well. And this would have been just plant dye that was used, you know, local plants that were used. I don't know the date of this rug because we don't have very much information about this particular one. Mid-19th century, I would say, maybe 1860s or so, 1870s. That's fascinating. And right at the beginning of the research, you called out to the local Shetlanders to bring in any heirloom rugs that they had in their houses for you to study. Were they able to tell you any interesting stories about the rugs that might have been handed down with the rugs from their families? Well, they were. They were, they were quite generous. A lot of people did come forward. Um, in some cases, they knew very little about the rug. Um, sometimes they could tell me the name of a maker um, and what craft they lived on. So I got a sense of the sort of geographical spread of rugs, which was another thing we looked at. Oftentimes, once they told me even small bits of information, family information, I was then able to do research and find out more about the family. For example, the date of the wedding or... Um, more about the sort of history of that particular person because sometimes they didn't really know all of that detail. So this was a really an exciting part for you, I can imagine, is actually finding out more about the lives, the individual lives, and, and how that might have reflected on, on what their day-to-day -day life looked like. Have you got a story that you can tell us that you might have found out? Actually, there is a story that I'd like to, to relate to you. It, it's about a rug that returned to Shetland after very many years. Uh, I was contacted, actually out of the blue, by a woman in New Zealand who uh, told me that her family had a rug, and she was considering donating it to our museum because she didn't know what would happen to it later on in, in life. So... She contacted me, and we started an email communication, and she eventually sent me the rug. And it turned out that the rug was made by um, the father of the bride in 1854. The bride went on to, after her marriage, um, she had seven children. And in 1874, she and her husband emigrated to New Zealand with seven children and a tatted rug, which a tatted rug would be a wonderful thing to have on a very long sea voyage with seven children because you could sleep under it, you could sleep on top of it, you could wrap yourself in it, um, it would remind you of home, and it's a lovely rug, it's in really good condition. It's actually one of the finest rugs we have the, the wool is quite soft, and it must have been really, really cozy on that boat journey. So it was shipped back to Shetland, um, and 140 years later, it came back to the islands. That's amazing, isn't it? It is, it is yeah. lovely, yeah. really lovely. And I, I'm so touched that yeah. she thought to return it to Shetland. Yeah, that's great. So you've spent many years 
researching these rugs and um, and then this book was published in, like I said, 2014. So that was a very interesting and would have been an, an all-time consuming project for you. I would love to have been your assistant and it must have been so much fun. <laughs> it was really interesting when we when we got into so, the sort of nitty-gritty of it. Yeah. And I still get people coming to me and saying, oh, I have a rug and do you want to have a look at it? And of course we do. Yeah, yeah, that's great. So the big question is, do you have a, a new project that you're researching now? Well, I do. There are other parts of the collection that need work. And so I'm about to launch into a new project. Okay, and you're going to tell us a little bit about it. Yep. Great. So the next project that we are going to embark on is uh, a two-year project that I received funding for from Museums Gallery Scotland to assess our lace collection. We have about 200 pieces of lace already catalogued in the collection, um, but we've received two fa fairly large private donations recently that number together about 200 pieces as well. So it would double our collection of, of lace. Some of these pieces are a bit what we might call open work. They're not the really fine Shetland lace, but they're still open work lace patterns. So the idea of the project is to uh, assess each piece of our knitted lace collection and to look at the condition of it, look at the cataloging record, and make sure that we uh, improve that by trying to identify makers or dates or some information about it. And then the other whole idea of it, the main, the main point of the project is to begin to record individual lace patterns. And you see in this stole we have uh, the basket of flowers. There are a number of these um, basket of flower patterns in our lace. Uh, some are bigger or different flowers, different leaves. And so we want to record you know, the variations even of some of these uh, same patterns. And then you see here in this border, there's a pattern here, a pattern here. There's this diamond with a Madeira in the middle. Um, so there's about four or five patterns just in this bit alone. And then we have this, this, and then we go into the, the center pattern, um, which also has a number of different patterns um, kind of intermingling. And that's the complexity of, of Shetland lace, where the designer, the lace knitter designer, integrated large numbers of patterns in a particular garment, just in a few rows even. And to try to sort out and understand where one pattern, you know, ends and another one begins and how they merge and how they're used in combination with each other or overlapping is a really complex thing, but that's something that we're trying desperately to understand. And what will happen with this project at the end is that we will have a publication where these particular motifs are charted. So that if, for example, you are an interest, uh, a highly skilled lace knitter, you would be able to understand those different elements and see how you can incorporate them into your designs. That's fantastic. So the charts will all be there. You'll not only be able to know how to knit those individual motifs, but get all these ideas of how you can combine them or, or make variations on the sizes even. Yes. And then, and then go about doing your own organic Shetland. Yes. You should sure. be able to. I would never be able to do that because I'm not a lace knitter. But for people who are... Um, it, that will be a useful book. But also, it's important for people who have pieces of lace to understand how they're made and what is involved in the design of them. Yeah. So other museum collections will be able to use this, this book as well. As a reference. Yes. Yeah, that's great. And, I mean, the Shetland lace, like you said, comes in a lot of different forms. You've got the super fine here, and that's all hand-spun, isn't it? Yes. And then over here, these gorgeous gloves. What can you tell us about the gloves? Well, these were part of this um, donation, uh, one of the donations. And they're, they just have this little pattern in them that's sort of an open work pattern, um, just at the top, because on the bottom they're plain. But it's such a beautiful, delicate 
um, glove, really. Looks like it might be a wedding glove. Almost. Yeah, it does look like that, it's, actually. It's so delicate. Um, but they're lovely, and they're just such... They're such a good design. They are, aren't they? They're fantastic. Yeah. Probably maybe made in the 1970s. They're not that old, but they're lovely. Do you think this is a machine... Uh, spun yarn or do you think it's a hand spun? No, I think that's machine. That's spun. machine. Mm -hmm. And then this one here is also very interesting. It's combining like lace work in the body and then very fine Shetland motifs in the ferrule yoke. Yes, and that's relatively unusual to combine open work and ferrule, but in this case I think they've done it really beautifully. Mm. Again, a machine made yarn um, and a fairly simple lace or open work pattern yeah. but then this beautiful delicate fair isle yeah. um, that's in the pastel colors it's just a lovely cardigan it is and the button bands they're done in a very fine moss stitch or seed yes. stitch but it is beautiful and what's what's great about it is the pattern here is small and delicate so nothing is too bold it, it still keeps it looking like it's a a dressy garment mm, it's right? a very feminine yeah. yoke and very much in contrast to the sort of bigger feral yokes that you see with those large uh, tree and star patterns. Mm. Another part of the project um, is to record, obviously, pattern in, in different garments, but also look at construction methods. And this little piece, essentially a knitted undershirt, uh, made out of hand spun, and it's in this very traditional design called De Print at a Wave. Um, but this particular version of De Print at a Wave is a very early one. And you see this um, design in published knitting patterns as early as 1840s. I don't know the date of this garment. It could be 1880s up to, say, 1920, perhaps. But it's got an interesting construction method, which is typically Shetland in this fact that it's knit from the bottom up all the way around and then down the back side. So there's no seam here at the shoulder. There's only seams on the sides. It's not knit in the round. It's knit flat. Um, and then at the bottom of the rib uh, here and the end of the little cap sleeves, um, there are holes made so that you can thread ribbon through here, so you can cinch it. So it's quite a delicate, almost sexy little garment sure is. For, <laughs> as an undergarment, really, um, but in this very traditional pattern. Yeah, I mean, that looks more like a luxury garment than a um, something that an average crofter would want to be wearing, doesn't it? Because it's so pretty, and when I think of vests, I think of vests, to give you that extra warmth. Mm. So it must have been a very special garment. Maybe, mm -hmm. but it could just be that the, the the woman who had it also knit it and just wanted to make herself something really feminine and yeah. lovely to wear underneath. Yeah, that's true. Yeah. Well, Carol, thank you so much again for showing us some of these gorgeous items from the collection and, and keeping us up to date with your new project. That is going to be a very exciting project mm. that I think a lot of knitters worldwide will get good mm. use out of to be able, because there's a lot of good uh, lace knitters around who would love to have access to these patterns mm. as a reference. We have some that haven't seen the light of day ever, so that'll be an exciting part of this. Yeah. That's, your work and life must be very interesting. <laughs> well, it is, and especially this week with Wool Week yeah. about to launch. So, yeah. yes, we have a lot on, but it's, it's good fun. Yeah. Okay, well, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you for having me. Okay, we'll say goodbye to the audience. Bye. Bye.